you don't know how many resources are available for free mm. in your local community. So you just look stuff up. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I am your host, Devin Miller, the uh, serial entrepreneur that's also a patent and trademark attorney um, and founder of Miller IP Law. And uh, today we have another uh, great uh, guest on The Inventive Journey as we talk through uh, his journey a bit. His name is Johnny, and he'll do a much better intro, but to give you a bit of a, a heads up, he is um, the founder of Cope Notes. He's also a, a bit of, I think he's a bit of a rocker, but I can't remember exactly what type of music, but rock, and I always get rock and classic rock and hard rock and heavy metal, all those good, but he has, he's part of a band and he, and he has, also has, if you're watching the uh, video version of it, he has some really awesome tennis shoes in the background, Nike shoes, so he's kind of got a, a whole bunch of things going on, but I'm excited to have him on, he's going to be a great guest, so welcome to the podcast, Johnny. Thank you for having me, brother. So I gave a really quick intro, and it was uh, I didn't I'm sure didn't do you enough justice, but maybe uh, give us a little bit of uh, your background, your journey, and how you got to, or how you got to where you're at today. Yeah, that's this is always something that is a challenge to sum up quickly. So I'll just give you some bullet points, um, classic entrepreneur story. So I just wanted to create something that I've needed my whole life. So grew up in an abusive environment. Um, drugs and alcohol around me. I managed to stay sober. Fortunately, I was in treatment for about 10 years um, for multiple mental health conditions, school for psych. Um, I survived abuse and suicide, and now I am dedicated to helping other folks who have faced some similar things. And I also have been touring in a metal band for over a decade. So there's, there's that part. I just say metal to keep things easy. So, so is there a difference, because this is a complete side note, has very little to do with the journey, but is there a difference between rock, metal, heavy metal? Are they dissimilar or completely different? How does that work? Um, there are so many subgenres that I just encourage people to not get lost in that mix and just listen to what they like. So I say metal to keep things easy. I think anyone who um, is into metal could probably technically alternative metal you're technically new metal but i just allow people to call it whatever they like all right fair enough that was a complete aside yeah as you can tell i, I i'm not in quite as metal as much i'm rock sure but kind of pop a little bit country a little bit so i have a genre but never got into metal as much so sometime we'll have to go and listen to some of your music but go for it anyway, with that um jumping back to your your journey and uh what you have going on go ahead Oh, so, I mean, that was pretty much as much context as I planned on giving. I mean, there's lots of information out there. Um, you can watch my TED Talk that tells a little bit more of my story. You can find me on social media and read more. But I really just try to use all of that personal experience as more of a backdrop. So I try not to camp out too much on what I've been through. I think there's enough of that stuff out there, you know? No, and I agree. So maybe when, maybe when I was heading there where we can go next, is, and we talked a little bit before, so you had a few different kind of startups that you started to get going. Some of them didn't work out quite as well or failed, but you also learned a lot from them to get you to it today. And I think you started kind of in, I guess, what, eight, nine years ago, 2012-ish, and you started to do some volunteering, support work, and advocacy, and then that kind of snowballed into some of your first startups. Is that, do I call that right? Uh-oh. I'm going to let you edit this part out. My microphone came unplugged for one second. It's back oh. in, right? <laughs> You're all right. Or okay. we'll just, it'll make it all the better with the ambiance of now we, everybody knows that there's technical difficulties that always happen. Yeah. Anyway, um, go ahead. Yeah, so getting involved in advocacy was important for me because I always figured that the only way to help other people with mental health issues was basically just to become a clinician. So I figured, okay, I have to spend a quarter million dollars on student loans and I have to be in school for the rest of my life in order to get my own little dinky office and then try to get teenagers to listen to me. And I'm like, you know what? That sounds totally feasible, but it's, if it's my only way to contribute, then I guess I'll do it. So I was in school for psych at the time and I got involved um, with the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI. Um, and if you're listening to this in the US, there's probably a chapter near you where you can get involved if you'd like. And I basically just showed up and I was like, what the heck can I do to help? 
and it turned out that there's lots of opportunities. And even if you don't have a doctorate or a master's degree, or, or even if you didn't go to school for psych, there's still a lot of ways to get involved. Mm. So you started down that road and did you finish the degree? Did you put that on hold? Did you decide to go a different direction or how did you kind of, you started down that road and then you decided maybe that the student loans of 250,000 was a bit much to go down that road or how did that play out? Well, my, it was weird because my band got signed while I was in college. So that really threw a wrench in everything. And I was like, you know what? I always wanted to do music anyway. So mm. I'll just finish my degree on tour, like on the road. And then, um, but I kind of figured I'll probably never work in psych again. I, th I guess I'll be a rock star forever. And as it turns out, you can't be a rock star forever. At a certain point, you get too old. And I'm fortunate that um, I'm still 27, so I still get to tour now. But I think a few years into touring, I was like, man, I probably won't be able to do this when I'm 50. Like, I want to I wanna also get involved in something else. All right. So you did that. So you started to do it on the road. I, and then you got I, busier with doing the, the touring and that. And then you moved on, I think, to 2015-ish. You did the Better People Tampa Bay, I think is that what you called it. And that was kind of your first real entree into outside of doing the rock tour and the, the into uh, doing kind of a startup or a small business. Yeah, but I don't even know if I would credit that as like a genuine effort. Like when you look back at how janky it was, it was like, it was like better people Tampa Bay at gmail.com. Like that's the level of intricacy. It, but keep in mind, let's see. I was 20, how the heck old was I in 2015? I was like 23 or something. And I just wanted to do something. And it turns out it's actually pretty difficult to organize something all by yourself. So I tried to get something off the ground. It didn't really catch. And then um, I didn't want to give up. I just knew that I couldn't keep pursuing. And basically for people who don't know, don't look it up. You probably can't find anything about it, but <laughs> It was a, it was maybe it's a challenge to, be, to everybody that now they have to go and see if they could find the, yeah. the fifth page of Google and find it. I, yeah, basically for people who are listening and wondering what the heck was it, it was uh, a, an in person peer support group for the metal and hardcore community. So mm. people with tattoos and dyed hair, and um, these are people who might not go to church, who might, who might not go to see a therapist or a counselor. So mm. I wanted there to be an option for, people in my subculture and pretty much straight away I realized how difficult and impossible to scale that was going to be especially for a 23 year old with no budget <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's probably uh, there's a few things working against you but I think it's cool I and even if it, you call it janky or you know it didn't work out I think there's a lot of things you can learn I think one of the things we talked a little bit about is some of the first few startups and we hit on another one um but they started, you, you figured out that if you centered them all around you, and even if you could scale it, you, you, can, you, you hit a critical mass, right? So if you center it all around one person, one person driving it, one idea that, you know, you can't expand it, it, it limits the scope of it, which is, I think, what we talked about that kind of limited some of your first startups when you tried to start getting into that. Yeah, I think a lot of people, depending on what they want to do, like if you want to run your own cupcake shop and that's like your dream, that is something that can revolve around you and your recipe and maybe a couple people. Mm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I actually adore business models that are that simple, like the less moving parts, the better. And But when you're trying to meet a, a greater need, it becomes i don't mean greater as in this is more important than someone's cupcake shop i mean when you're trying to serve people not just in your local community when you're trying to serve people who live in other cities and other countries you quickly realize like okay let's do the math how many people will i eventually have to hire to manage how many different accounts and how and then you're like holy crap there needs to be some level of scale where if I lose internet for a day that the whole system doesn't explode, you know? No, and I agree. And I, I think that that's the, I think true across a lot of industries and startups. I mean, usually most startups you'll have, you know, one or two people, a founder, a co-founder, a couple of your very core people. And yet, you know, I, I agree with you. If, if you're in a mom and pop shop and I like those, I live in a small town and I like those, but it is a different, you're saying, Hey, I'm just going to serve my local area. That's what I want to do. I think it's very, you know, worthwhile 
So if you're saying, hey, we're going to have a bigger expansive reach, we're going to hit more people, or we're going to have more channels or platforms or avenues, building it all around one or two people makes it very hard to scale because no matter how awesome of a person you are, you only have so, you only have so many hours in the day, only ability to do so many things, and your time keeps getting more and more crunched. So I think that that's a lesson, depending on your business, that the people need to learn is that you know you need to figure out how you can make this scalable or how you can not have a center or if you know and i always use i i'm a big advocate i love to watch you know shark take or that and they give the example if you're to walk out on the street and get hit one day by a bus you know are you is the whole company centered around you to where you know sink or swim is that one person or have you set it up to where it can move on or it can go without you or you know there isn't just one critical person so i think that's you know a good lesson to learn early on so then we did, I think your next business that we talked about before Cope Notes was, was it not a therapist? Is that the next one? Yeah. So maybe give a little bit of insight as to what that was, how that went and how that led to where you're at. Yeah. So that was version 2.0. So version 1.0 was peer support in person. Mm -hmm. um, I quickly realized how impossible that would be a scale. So then I thought, oh, the, the way that you scale something is you just make it digital and then it's magically scalable, which is not true. <laughs> So, um, it, I thought it was, I thought that was true. You just wrecked my, all my dreams. Dude. It, I, I mean, think about it. Like we, I think everyone thinks they're, they're different enough to sidestep the boundaries of what a human is capable of. So mm. like, I remember when my band was signed, my first band was signed and I started another band and there was label interest from that band. And I told them, I told that label, like, I can do two bands at once. And they're like, no, you have to quit your old band if we're going to sign the new one. And I said, no, you don't know me. I'm different. Like, I will put so much time into it. I'm so driven. And they're like, yeah, we don't care. Like, we, it doesn't matter who you are. We know the limitations of an individual. So like you're saying, everyone has a ceiling mm -hmm. and everyone thinks that they don't or that theirs is higher than everyone else's. And so with not a therapist, I thought, oh, the problem isn't that it's tied to my time. The problem is that I just can't reach as many people at once because it's in person. So I'll make it digital. And mm. it was digital peer support. And um, it was name your price. Surprise, everyone picked $0. That was the most popular option. Um, so I didn't make- Surprise, kind of nobody it. wants to pay for something they can get for free. Yeah, and I worked- I was working uh, 50 hours a week at an ad agency. I was touring full time in a band. And by full time, I mean six to eight months a year. Hmm. Um, you're on the road. So also working at the ad agency. And then for around 40 hours a week, I'm doing not a therapist, not making a penny from it. And you don't make a penny from music, by the way. So don't get that confused. <laughs> um, not as an artist anyway. So at, at this time, I was getting so burnt out because I knew that, I couldn't get people to work for me for free. Like I couldn't find people mm -hmm. like, Hey, do you want to break your back and volunteer <laughs> full time for this too? So I knew that at a certain point, you know, not a therapist started small ish. And mm -hmm. then we started getting like around 40 to 60 different appointment requests a week. And I'm like, well, if each one of these is an hour, what have I done to myself? <laughs> so we were I think we realized by we, I mean me, mm -hmm. I at that point, because I kept trying to ask people to help me and they're like, no. So I think I realized if I can't get people to help, I, if I can't get people to care about what I care about enough to help, then I need to build a thing where I can rely on some level of automation so that I can care efficiently enough to, to do this feasibly. And make money, right? <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, for a lot of people who start businesses, that's like not even on the table when you're thinking about the idea. Like the original idea for Cope Notes was for it to be free for everybody, no cost. And then um, when you start doing the math on text credits and how that's we have to purchase, yeah. yeah, when you realize that, here's what I didn't understand when I started Cope Notes. I didn't understand that when you have an unlimited text plan, it's not that your texts, you can send however many you want for, for $40 or whatever. It's that past $40, your cell carrier foots the rest of the bill. Mm. So it's kind of like a buffet. 
It's like if you eat a lot and someone else eats a little, it evens out. So eventually when I started working with SMS wholesalers, I'm like, wait a second, I have to pay every time I send 153 <laughs> characters. And they're like, yeah, hard cost, no matter what. And I'm like, don't you have an unlimited plan? They're like, no, you yeah. pay for what you use. And I'm like, oh no, if I get a lot of people using this, it's going to be so expensive. <laughs> it's going to be super expensive and I'm going to start losing money. Well, I think that that's, but I think it's an important point. Cause I mean, when I look at it and there's a little bit of, you know, especially if you get into whether it's therapy and I work with, you know, one of the businesses I work with is religious products, right? A little bit different, but kind of the same feel. And you get people are sometimes saying, hey, you're profiting off of religion or you're profiting off of people's pain or, you know, their life experiences. And then, mm. you know, almost that kind of that you shouldn't be able to make a property. You shouldn't be able to charge anything. It should be free. And yet you're not able to provide a service that's adequate. If you can't run everything off of free for an, an infinite amount of time, As you, there's a website cost, there's this SMN cost, SM, in or sorry if i can say it texting costs there is you know the support costs and everything else and while you want to do it as you know reach as many people you have to figure out that's how i do it is i have to be able to support the business so that we can have the staff so we can have the system in place so we can reach those people otherwise it just makes it uh, too un or too untenable so you're never going to be able to accomplish your mission because you try and make it free i don't i'm not putting words in your mouth that's just kind of something i found as well yeah, it's so I've always had a weird mentality around um, working full time in the mental health field. But it's here's the way I look at it. First of all, I don't feel guilty about anything that I'm doing now because I spent 10 years volunteering in the mental mm -hmm. health field without any compensation. I'm traveling all over the place, speaking at events, leading classes like I have put in mm -hmm. my time. But beyond that, even if I hadn't, here's the way I look at at employment either i mean you have to make money there is no version of life as an adult where your rent will be waived because you're a nice person <laughs> and you don't have to pay for your groceries at the store or your gas at the gas station because people are just so moved by the work that you're doing unfortunately that's not how it works so right. you need to make money somehow and the way i see it is you can either make money helping people or make money doing something that doesn't help anybody and those are your only two options because you have to make money somehow so anyone who is working in a field that you have to sow a bunch of compassion into i can almost guarantee that those people myself included can make much more money doing something that didn't help anybody so the sacrifice is still there if i make yeah. half as much doing a job that is helping people or i could make twice as much not helping people i will choose the helping people option every time it's mm. it's weird i mean even look at teachers they don't yeah, get paid no, that's garbage was, that's my exact i have my both my my uh, mother-in-law and my sister are both teachers and i look and say you could go into and i'm, I'm probably straight too much far to the other side I, i'm more of a capitalist and i like to make money and build it's not that i don't like helping people don't get me wrong oh I, yeah i found in miller ip because i wanted to help startups and small businesses that i thought were kind of getting overlooked in the market and to your point, I could go in if I just worked with the big companies and the big firms, I would make more money. But mm -hmm. you're saying, you know, there is a point you're saying, I make enough that I want to have the impact. What's more valuable, I have to have the groceries, I have to be able to pay the rent. But beyond that, I'd rather have the impact. I'd rather have that lifestyle and feel good about what I'm doing rather than just solely focus on money. So I, I, I think that that's an absolutely valid point. And we have to remember that people who spend their their time and expertise and compassion doing something that's helping other people those people don't just deserve the bare minimum mm -hmm. like teachers deserve to drive a car that they like and teachers deserve to go on vacation to another country if they want to like these people don't just deserve like oh if you're working in the nonprofit space or if you're working um serving underprivileged communities like you should be making $20,000 a year and you should be happy with it. It's like, what the heck? Like I, if the amount of compassion fatigue that goes along with, with helping other people in your profession, you need self care built into that. And sometimes self care looks like getting yourself a massage or something. And if you're on a shoestring budget, you can't afford stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I like the idea of, you know, and I don't know if it's your term, but that's the first I've heard of compassion fatigue. And I think that there's a lot of truth to it. So if I were to then recenter us, because we, we can go down that route for the whole rest of the podcast, but taking it back to Cope Notes. So now we did, so you did that. You started out with, you know, Better People Tampa Bay. 
that didn't quite work out. Um, and then you got to not a therapist. You figured out that you can't, you, texting isn't free. It's not unlimited. And so now you moved over to Coke Notes, which is kind of almost felt like, kind of like said, a version 1.0, 2.0, and now you're a 3.0, learning everything along the way. So maybe give a quick summary. What is Coke Notes or how does it work or what is what does version 3.0 look like? It is so much simpler than anything I've done before. Thank God. So it doesn't have a lot of moving parts. Basically, it's we provide daily mental health support via text message. That's the simplest way I can put it. So once a day, we send you a text message that is filled with peer support and positive psychology. And then you can text back saying whatever you want, whenever you want. And that thread, instead of connecting you with a crisis counselor or having someone call you or it being reported to your work or anything like that. It's completely anonymous and it's for you to have a space to freely journal and speak. So this improves the health of your thought patterns. This changes your uh, habit building patterns over time. This helps you improve in your self-report and emotional IQ. So it's really ultimately a text thread in your phone, just like you have with your family or your friends, only it is specifically designed to make you mentally and emotionally healthier. And I think one of the questions, I, when I first heard, I think hey, it's a great idea, but I, I said, well, why can't, you know, if it's, it's just really a text message, would people actually just pay for, you know, text message, you know, and I, and I always thought, and not saying this is what you do, you know, if I get a text message, that everybody says, don't forget to be happy. And that's all I got. I'd say, well, that's probably not enough value to warrant me paying. So how did you kind of tailor, you know, you talked about tailoring it, making it so it is actually helpful. And I think we talked a little about you actually base it off of, you know, proven principles and psychology and actually making it more helpful in that than just don't worry, be happy kind of a message. So how does that work? Or how did you kind of set that up? Yeah, I think that's the most common misconception is people are like, oh, you're just going to text me smile. And I'm not paying anybody anything for that. And that's like, that is, if Cope Notes looked anything like that, I would not waste any time on it. Because personally, for me, stuff like that does nothing for me. Um, so basically, the way it works is we have a giant text library. And it's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of approved text messages that are written by peers with lived experience. So we have that peer support base, that mm -hmm. empathy is baked into it. And then they are not only are these texts based on proven psychological principles, but then they're reviewed by a panel of mental health professionals to make sure that they're not just smile or be happy today, to make sure that these will have a discernible positive effect over time. So we, even if the messages seem very simple to the reader, that's actually by design. We're not trying to send super complex jargon filled text messages to people. We are trying to strategically interrupt negative thought patterns with something that's easy to digest mm -hmm. where over time, the way I view it is kind of like bumpers. If you ever go bowling, mm -hmm. if you, if your ball kind of bumps against one of the bumpers, all it does is keep it going straight. And that's sort of what cope notes does we're not knocking your ball three lanes over or anything like that to me that's therapy is sitting down with someone and digging through all your past and that is some that is some really heavy lifting but cope notes is that maintenance tool that keeps you headed in the right direction no i think that's a, that's a good point is you know you're not trying to be the full therapist that dives in deep and tries to give you know psychoanalyze and you know go through deep and, and, and figure out exactly what all the problems are rather you're just saying hey this is to help you on a day-to-day -day basis. I like the idea, the idea of kind of guardrails or bumper, you know, bumper rails. It just this keeps you moving straight, keeps you on the right path so you don't get down into the gutter and you don't go off course. So I think that's a great, great analogy. So that's cool. So then as you did it, you, so you take in third iteration of the company, you're on Cope Notes. Has it been just to skyrocket to the top and no issues and no problems and trials? Or is it like 99.9% .9 of other startups that you've had the bumps and the ups and downs along the way? Or how's it gone for you? I would love to sit down and interview on my podcast, the founder who has not experienced speed bumps or roadblocks in the first two and a half years. I want to meet that person. That one person in all the world. That ask fighting. them. Yeah, it's been really challenging, actually. Um, one of the main things that we run into is that people don't immediately understand the idea of preventative mental health care. 
Mm. So the, here's what everyone says. There's something called self-stigma, which basically is the sentiment that everybody else needs this, but I don't need it because mm. my brain is perfect and I never struggle with anxiety or depression or negative thoughts about myself, um, which in, in probably 100% of cases is untrue. All of us experience these negative emotions. All of us experience um, things that we could improve on when it comes to our mental and emotional health. And I think one of our main hurdles is trying to get people to overcome the idea that they're perfect. And here's what I would say to those people. Um, the idea, you know, if you see someone with super healthy teeth, like super white, super straight, never had a cavity, do you think that those people never brush their teeth because they don't need to because their teeth are so healthy? Or do you think those people brush their teeth and floss every day and use mouthwash? I'm, I'm married to one of those people that drive me nuts because she. Ne I'm the guy that has all the cavities and my wife's the one that has zero cavities. She does, And then she gives me a hard time. When you were growing up, you didn't brush your teeth as well. You didn't floss as well. You didn't use mouthwash. So I, I completely agree with that analogy that she's the one that's put in the work. I, I have since repented and take much better care of my teeth, but there is an absolutely <laughs> an idea, idea to that. Dude, that, that honestly has been probably our biggest roadblock is, is mm. helping educate people that if you have a brain, the topic of mental health is pertinent to you. It's not just people in straight jackets or people who live in mental hospitals or all, all of these terrible misconceptions that we have about mental health, like you and your friends and your family, everyone can afford to invest in their mental and emotional health, whether it's simple techniques like taking breaths or taking a walk or stretching or speaking to someone about what we're going through. And it's the biggest hurdle when people ask um, who our biggest competitor is, I always say pride. Mm. That's what keeps people from engaging with cope notes is people thinking and asserting that their brain is somehow so different that they don't even need to focus on their mental and emotional health at all. No, I, uh, but I, it's one that it's easy to tell yourself. You're the, kind of like, you know, telling yourself the exception, I'll work harder than everybody else. And yet there's only so many hours mm -hmm. of the day same thing as no matter how healthy you are. And I, I think there are varying degrees of people that are able to naturally deal with things better and people that have need more assistance, but everybody has their ups and their downs and their highs and lows. And while those may vary, everybody has them. So I think that that's a, a fair point. So, mm -hmm. so now for you're looking, say cope notes, you, you know, trying to figure out that out, how to position it, how to, you know, get people to understand that, how to, you know, mark that or, you know, get that information out. What do you see as the next six months to a year for cope notes? So we are trying to focus more on partnerships and um, connecting with community organizations. So schools, businesses, um, healthcare providers, insurance providers, and just trying to meet these needs at scale. Because one thing that we're finding out is um, a lot of businesses are like, we don't know what to do for workplace wellness because every time we try to do an, in an initiative, the employees don't engage. And it's like, well, that's because they have to tell the HR person that they want to enroll. They have to elect and that information becomes available or known to someone that they see on a daily basis. And there's actually like social pressures that decentivize enrollment and engagement for student wellness, for employee wellness. So what we're trying to do is anonymize and automate that whole process. So employees don't have to report to anybody that they're using it because we don't collect names mm. and students don't have to alert their guidance counselor who might tell their parents or guardian or something or teachers. Honestly, with stigma, the way it is, we are trying to make enrollment in mental health services as covert as possible to protect that person's relationships and, and work and school environment. So Ultimately, we're just trying to ramp up our partnerships with those organizations and say, hey, if you have students who are struggling with this or you have employees who are struggling with this, mm. we can step in as a third party to where no sensitive information is being shared anywhere and we can keep it anonymous enough to where folks will actually use the resource. No, I, that's a 
great, great direction to take it. Great idea. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So, well, we're getting towards the end of the podcast and I always, almost every podcast I say, I wish there was more time. There's always more things that we could talk about and we'll have to have people back on and you're certainly no exception. It's been a fun, fun journey and a fun podcast to, to go through and, and talk about what you guys are doing. But if, um, as we wrap up, so people want to get, I guess we'll jump to my two final questions and then we'll do that. So far to ask, I always ask two final questions at the end of each podcast. Um, so I'll ask those now. And the first one is, so if, what is your worst business decision? My worst business decision was initially declining help from who is now our CTO. Mm. Uh, so his name is Matt Cross. He's amazing. I love the guy. He's a, a big reason why we're able to serve as many people as we are. And when he initially reached out to me, he was like, um, do you need help with security or with scale or with dev stuff and coding? And I was like, no, I got it. I'll watch YouTube tutorials and I'm <laughs> sure there's stuff online about it. And I think that's an example of pride. I was like, no, I can do it myself. I don't need your help. And I'm, I'm lucky that he was so persistent in being willing to help me because here we are a year and a half later and he's, he's my right hand man. So wow. just, I think my, my biggest mistake was um, declining help when it was offered because I was too determined to do it myself. I think that, and I think that's universal along a lot of startups. A lot of times you're the, you know, if you're a founder, you're the person that came up with the idea, you're like, Oh, I can do it myself and I can figure it out. Not a big deal and everything else. And yet, most of the time, even if it, you could, you know, and I have that attitude, hey, I can do this better than anybody else type of a thing. And while, even if that's true, and I don't think it's true most of the time, you, it still limits the ability as to what you can get done and how quickly you can grow it, how quickly you can scale it, how many people can help. So I think that that's a great lesson to learn. Okay. So if now if I were to jump on to the second question, somebody that's just getting into startups, just getting into small businesses or wanting to get into them, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give them? Um, you don't know how many resources are available for free mm. in your local community. So you just look stuff up, like call for, for me, it was a small business development center, SBDC. Um, but you can look around. There's like, I live in Tampa and there's like a Tampa Bay economic center or something. And there's all of these places, oh, like entrepreneurship collectives and stuff where you live Google stuff, try to find free resources because I got a consultant early on for free and I can meet with him. I think it was once every two weeks mm. and it was free, free business consulting for a small business. Like, especially when you don't have a, you don't have a ton of money laying around, this is invaluable. So I would encourage people to look in their local community for free resources, specifically consulting services where they can just ask those dumb questions like, I have dumb questions all the time and it's so crucial to have somebody to ask. And if they don't know, they will let you know, but to not have to pay for that mm. is incredible. So please look in your local community. I can guarantee you there are free resources that you can take advantage of right now. So don't let money keep you from getting the advice and guidance that you need. No, I think that's great advice. And I think that too often people either don't think about or don't look out for them or don't take the time to research. And yet there's a lot of resources out there because a lot of times, well, whether it's local government, local community, there's people in the community are wanting to help and willing to provide their time or offer it up or there's those resources. So yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Well, as, as people want to reach out, they want to get involved, whether it's, you know, use Cope Notes, they want to invest in it, they want to partner up with it, they want to incorporate it with their business or whatever, what's the best way to reach out to you or to make those connections? So if you go to copenotes.com, our website, there is a contact button at the bottom. You can fill out a form. Um, I personally read through all of those still. So if you need to reach me, if it's about business, if it's about speaking or cope notes or advocacy, whatever you need to reach out to me about, I would strongly recommend the contact form. And again, the website is just copenotes.com. Perfect. Well, I've certainly encouraged people that are wanting to reach out, connect, or otherwise to get engaged to, to contact you and to, to, go to, the, to go to the website. So, well, I appreciate you coming on to the show today. It's been a fun time. Great to talk about your journey. Wish we had another couple hours to go through, although I don't <laughs> think people would have the attention, but there are plenty of fun things to dive into. But I appreciate you coming on. It's been, a, it's been great. 
For those of you that are interested in coming on to uh, the in Inventive Journey, um, being a guest and telling your journey, you can go to inventivejourney.com and apply to be on the show. Um, if you want to uh, subscribe or listen to get notifications to the uh, episodes as they come out, you can subscribe to any of our channels that we, uh, we have uh, through, whether it's on the audio or the video version. And for those of you, if you need help with any patents or trademarks, um, feel free to reach out to us at Miller IP Law, and we're happy to help there as well. Thanks again, Ken, Johnny, for coming on. It's been a fun time to have you on. You've been a great guest, and uh, wish you guys a, a great future journey at Cope Notes. Thank you, brother. You too. <laughs>